Hey, welcome back. We're continuing our Becoming an Embodied Catholic Leader series here, and we're looking at how the Catholic leader always receives and submits to the vision of God first. Mm -hmm. Well, you got to be a good discerner to do that. And when you discern, you discern in light of who you are, your unique design. We've been exploring this through the temperaments. Today, we're focused on the melancholics. Yes. So all you melancholics out there, listen up. This is going to be really good. I'm going to be taking Matt through it. It's his secondary, but it's a high secondary. It's a strong secondary, yes. So you guys, yeah, stick around. All right. Enjoy. See you in there. Hello, guys. Welcome back. What are we doing today, Oh, Matt? gosh. We <laughs> know what we're doing. We are continuing on with our uh, our series on the embodied Catholic leader, becoming an embodied Catholic leader. And we're looking at those five operating principles of what it means to be a leader. Today, mm-hmm. we're focusing again on Envision. We've done two podcasts already looking at the temperaments, uh, specifically choleric and sanguine. And now we're going to be jumping into the melancholic, mm-hmm. right? Next week will be phlegmatic. Don't you worry, phlegmatics. We haven't forgotten about you. Sometimes you feel like we've forgotten about you, but no. we never forget about the phlegmatics. No, the phlegmatics don't care. <laughs> That's the funny That's thing. That's why we make you guys wait to be the fourth episode that yeah, drops all the time. <laughs> you are the most compliant. Anyway, um... Okay, so in vision, in vision, there was like a there's a big emphasis on discernment Mm -hmm. because it's not necessarily it's not our vision that we are bringing others into, Mm -hmm. right? Because that's the first step is like this envisioning um, process of clarifying a vision, but because we're Catholic and because we're Christian and we know that God is the one with the first vision. Mm We need to be open to him. So really what we've been breaking down is this element, this um, discernment. What does each step of discernment look like in each one of the temperaments? Yes. And we have those four steps, which is offer, and then we listen, then we act, and then we examine, right? And so we mm-hmm. kind of rinse and repeat, go through that. And so uh, what we do on this podcast, we want to make sure that you start to embody some of these steps so that you can discern well based on who you are, based on your unique design. We're exploring that through your temperaments today. Mm-hmm. Today we're going to focus on the melancholic. So we're going to be looking at how the melancholic shows up in each one of those steps and where the melancholic may be inclined to have a defect or mm-hmm. a common defect there. Uh, if the show, shoe fits, wear it. If not, Listen with everything that we say, to everything we say with discernment. Yes, speaking um, of discernment. Speaking of discernment, yeah. right? Lean into, and we're going to teach you how to discern how to discern what we're teaching you. <laughs> it seems <sighs> like a riddle. Um, anyway, okay, so <laughs> melancholic. Great. The melancholic um, temperament. Um, so th- the Catholic description of a temperament is a series of inclinations and reactions of how a particular person shows up to some sort of stimuli, Mm -hmm. you know, outside stimuli. And so um, the melancholic shows up slowly, so not quick to react, Mm -hmm. shows up um, with a low intensity but starts to build over time, turns into a higher intensity, Mm -hmm. and then um, the duration lasts for a very long time. Yeah. We liken it to the person that is driving through uh, the dry brush in the wilderness and they flick a cigarette out the window and it starts with kind of like a little small smolder and then it expands and next thing you know it's a raging wildfire okay that lasts a long time that's kind of the way that the melancholic reacts one of the reasons um why the melancholic reacts in such a way is they have a very strong interior life they're thinking a lot so Mm -hmm. uh and actually there's like i've seen some reports that say about 40 percent. it's not like 40 percent of people are dominant melancholic right and they're all people of all people are dominant melancholic uh, we've certainly seen that reflected in our results from our temperaments assessment, mm-hmm. but it's it's not like a 25, 25, 25 percent. We're not looking for you know a quarter to be across all temperaments. Mm. So interesting enough, by God's design, he wants the world filled with more deep thinkers mm-hmm. and less knife-handing actors like the clerics that are there. Yeah. Okay, cool. Cool. All right. So let's go into this. All right. So we're going to dive into the the four steps that we have of discernment and we're going to talk mm-hmm. about uh how the melancholic experiences you guys ready to go you melancholics ready yeah all right yeah so the it. first step is offer 
where we offer it. I always like using the visual of like um, the offertory at mass. Mm -hmm. You present it and you surrender it, <laughs> you know, just like the offertory at mass. Like yes. you don't go back and go like, well, oh, let me see that bread before you turn it into. Let me do what I think needs to happen with that bread. Yes. Right. Before you turn it into like, I don't know, like, before the transubstantiation happens, like you know, go back and grab it. Um, and so there's that one. The listen one is when we just stop talking and we actually listen to what the Lord is saying. Mm -hmm. The third one is act. And taking massive action and like continual action, right? Not like acting and stopping, acting, stopping, like, you know, so just continually to act. And um, examine is reflection. And you're really just like examining the fruits of your actions mm -hmm. at that at that time. Cool. And so those are the four steps of discernment. We're going to take the melancholic through it. Okay, so let's, uh, I'm going to be the melancholic because it's my secondary, right? Though I still have quite a, it's a strong secondary. It, yeah, it's pretty high for you. For me, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, so Aaron, you got it. All right, let's yeah, talk yeah. about my defective discernment techniques as a melancholic. Yes, let's, let's be very defective. Let's go into my defects. Yes. Okay, so offer, Matt, when you present what you want to the Lord, um, what, what would you say is, is it is a common melancholic defect, but also yours? Okay. Well, I think it's I don't know what I don't know what to offer, mm. and so this is like me drawing from coaching melancholics, yes, uh, and also a little bit of my own experience. So I'm, my cleric seems to be pretty decisive mm -hmm. with that, and so I don't sit in that confusion. But dominant melancholics, primary melancholics, could sit in this place of confusion a little bit more, and um, why it's a problem. Okay, so when we talk about discernment. It's not just an event that takes place, it's a relationship with the Lord. So mm -hmm. if we understand discernment as a relationship, and then we can start to see, okay, what what causes a defect in that relationship? Okay, mm -hmm. so here, why is it a problem to just uh, be spinning in confusion while, discernment, while in discernment in this step? Um, well, I mean, I think it's a problem because... What I know about melancholics is it's it's a lie. Okay, you do know what you want. You ha you do have strong desires, which is a bold, provocative statement. Where it's just like you're not confused, you're lying, right? You actually know what you want, but you're just not wanting to say. So tell me, it's the problem is why yeah. you don't want to say, right? Because uh, here, here's the reason why I jumped to that provocative statement okay. is I have coached a lot of melancholics, mm -hmm. and the minute I go, but what do you want? They'll, they'll kind of go back and forth, and, and then I go, you're not allowed to say I don't know, right? Mm -hmm. And then they'll be like, well, I want this. And it's usually this very, like, ideal, like, you know, uh, elaborate, elaborate vision that mm -hmm. they've already thought about. You know, it's not the first time they're thinking about it at that moment. Okay, so they spin in confusion. Yes. We can tend to spin in confusion as melancholics. I'm speaking mm -hmm. to my fellow melancholics out there. Because there's just perhaps even a fear there of not receiving this ideal. Mm. You know, when we start to voice out loud our desires, especially our ideal desires, it, it can be kind of scary because it's just like, oh, I really do want this. What happens if I don't get it? And so it starts to kind of stir a little bit of the, um, the longing for yeah. that, that unfulfilled longing. And that can be just kind of a uncomfortable place right but again it's different when we under and when we understand that we're presenting it not to a friend or a spouse or a coach or some somebody has no ability to fulfill that longing with you but when you're presenting it to god mm. that's when it starts to change a little bit but i think there's a little bit of for me too it's it's like desiring certainty over faith as yeah well. yeah i was i was just gonna say that i'm like i think it's this um Yes, they want like it to be perfect before they present it, the like vision. Or, yeah. or figured out. Like I, because I mean, one of the reasons why melancholics is, feel so hard is because they think so hard, mm -hmm. and um, they'll just spin and spin and spin. Like, oh, I got to figure this out before I present it to the Lord. <laughs> but also, I think it's because, and really, I think this is the fear that's underneath all of it. Exactly mm -hmm. what you said is they have high expectations and they don't believe it's going to be met. Mm -hmm. They don't believe their expectation is going to be met. And so they're really nervous about that disappointment and that sadness um, about feeling that in the future. And, yes. and maybe they can avoid it if they maybe just don't say it or if they don't say it or they, that 
they're confused. Yeah, the spinning confusion, I can see how that thing is, is, is self-protective. Yeah. So, again, why is this a barrier to good discernment, all right? Well, it's a barrier to entering into a relationship with God because at the root of it, it's, there's this thought, perhaps, mm-hmm. I don't believe that you're going to fulfill this yeah. ideal. This thing is so big, how could you possibly fulfill it? I don't think that you're actually going to deliver on so it. So are those like some of the mindsets? That's that's well, we're starting to get in some of the, the mindsets. Yeah, but there's but it's also like there's there's also a if if I can continue to think about this and get clarity on it, that I can be the author of clarity. Like mm. it, again, there's this thought that I can arrive at clarity without God, uh. or I can arrive, and that clarity gives a certainty to it as well. So where we have certainty, we don't need faith. Mm. Okay. So again, this is a barrier where we don't need faith, where we don't need to lean on God and admit our own finiteness mm-hmm. because we think that we have this infinite capacity to conceptualize something that will satisfy our infinite desires, which were given to us by God in the first place, right? There's, you see the error that's all throughout that. Okay. It becomes a barrier to that relationship with God and more reliance. It goes this path of ungodly self-reliance and pride. So it's, it's problematic because it's it's dishonest and in like i guess lying by omission right it's not saying like here's particularly what i want but i think it's almost like the mindset behind Mm -hmm. is like it's not ready yet like i I can't really present this to you lord because it's not ready yet yes and and the melancholic desires to have that clarity of conception yeah right Mm -hmm. uh and there's there's something that's good in that we can affirm that we want to have that clarity before moving forward in that Mm -hmm. But if we just look at the mindsets that are that are behind some of this, okay, so shoe fits where it's, I think it's something like this. I don't know what I want, mm-hmm. right? That's kind of there. That, that leads to that spinning and confusion. I'm not ready to share this yet mm-hmm. is often something that, that, that's there. Now, there could be some prudence with that, but be like at some point we present, right? Mm-hmm. And that some point is always now when we're talking about presenting to mm-hmm. the Lord, okay? Because he's the one that actually gets it ready to present. Uh I don't want to get this wrong. Ooh. Yeah, I, I think that there's there. another nuance to that one where it's like, I I don't know if I will receive what I am expecting. Okay. Like there's like, I have high expectations and I, I don't know if it's going to turn out yeah. that way. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So those are those are some of the thoughts. I think there's one more that I had in my notes. I flipped too early. Um, I just need more time to think about it. Yes. You do not. <laughs> If you are melancholic, you do not need more time to think. Like those, that's that moment where you do surrender it. Yes, and you now, bring it to the Lord. Now let's not go to the extreme and say that. Like, okay, usually the melancholic's ideal conditions are having some quiet time to sure. think. Sure. Okay, so like there's some time, but good discernment has an expiration date. Yeah. All right. So it's not endless discernment that is procrastination. Okay, it's not a virtue, but good discernment has mm-hmm. uh, a date, and oftentimes our circumstances can kind of dictate what that date is for so uh example um that i have in my own life is is that well no this is like i mean both both of us okay right go ahead you tell me but it's more aaron you're coaching coaches so you see the coaches that just kind of spin this confusion they say i don't know i don't know what i have to offer mm-hmm. yeah and part of it might be true like maybe you don't know what you have to offer and maybe mm-hmm. you need that intentional alone time that intentional thinking time to figure that out Mm -hmm. Um, but I do think it's grounded in this belief where it's like, um, it has to be perfect first because if, if I present something that doesn't have immediate and, and results that immediate, that immediately meet my expectations, it hasn't worked. Yeah. And so there's, there's that perfectionism that's showing up there. And, and I think where this is, there's an error here, right? Is there's this there's a thought that I can be perfect instantly. Like if I think enough mm. about it, if I get it, the image perfect enough, then I, my actions can be perfect enough. And I don't have to avoid, I don't have to avoid the, I can avoid the pain of failure, mm. right? And where this is really errant, I'd say, is that that failure is actually part of the maturation journey. And so it's kind of like, I want to grow without the cross. There's a little bit of that, right? Mm-hmm. That's going on here. Uh, but there's a whole lot of image management that ends up taking place here as well. So you can see how that mindset starts to fan the the flames of, of vainglory here as well. And uh, again, it's there's a lot of me focus. When I hear mm. coaches or clients that are like, they are really worried about failure. There's a lot of, 
I statements and me statements in their thinking. There's a yeah. lot of focus on themselves. And again, focus on mm-hmm. ourselves, it's not going to lead to a deep relationship. And relationship with God is really what discernment is. Yeah. Okay, so we see those barriers that are there. Hey guys, really excited to share with you an incredible deal. Matt, what do we got? So we've got our Catholic coaching certification that's coming up. So anybody that's curious about becoming a certified Catholic coach with Metanoia Catholic, uh, you want to check this out. The early bird special that we've got actually goes from now until August 27th, extended payment option for those people that really want a little bit more of a cost-conscious payment plan for becoming that certified Catholic coach ends on August 27th. So if you want to sign up for that or download our brochure to learn a little bit more about our certification program, you can do all of those things. But you got to act quick if you want to be part of that early bird payment plan. From an application standpoint, Erin. I mean, I think just like consider, like, first of all, perfection is good that you seek perfection. We are all all made for perfection. Mm Mm-hmm. At the end of our lives, right? With like that beatific vision. Yeah, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. But it's really considering the source of the perfection. Yes. It is not up to you to perfect yourself. It's impossible, actually. It's like, you know, an imperfect tree cannot by its own will create perfect fruit. It just, it hasn't worked (laughs) ever, you know? So waste, like if you're, if you feel like you're wasting your time thinking about that or, or trying to perfect yourself, you are. Because it's not your job to perfect yourself. Yeah. And it is it is the perfecter who is God. He is the one. He is the source. Yes. So that desire to be a sincere gift, let's affirm that. Like yeah. We, we associate perfection with mm-hmm. sincerity, right? Mm-hmm. And man cannot know himself except through the sincere gift of self. The right? word sincere actually means full gift of self. Love it. Yes. Yeah. It means like without, like, like a, a fullness to it. Yeah. Got it. Okay. And, and Aaron, you hit on it. It's like, how do we become that sincere gift? It's not by sitting in our room and trying to conceptualize in our mm-hmm. finite capacity, in our, like in our imperfection. And then we're going to be the source of our own perfection. It happens through that relationship with God. There's going to be a leaning. There's going to be more obscurity mm-hmm. going forward that is going to call us into faith, but that's a good thing. Calls us into relationship with God. There will be uncertainty that will be uncomfortable. That may be a trigger for a lot of the ruminations and the what ifs and the, mm-hmm. and the you know the the fear of failure and the catastrophizing that we melancholics can do very well. Mm-hmm. And you guys are perfect at like, catastrophizing. We're, <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. But but it's also like you can you can also believe very hard. You can take that strong ruminations. Yes. And you can route it towards that which really starts to feed yeah. the faith. I, I want to add one more thing. To really um, reflect on the offertory prayer at Mass, I am I know the idea of the prayer. I never really say it because I'm not the priest. But it's this idea of bringing these imperfect gifts up mm-hmm. to the altar to be, you know, transformed into the body and blood of Christ. Yeah. And even the way that, like, these are, it's like, Fruit of the vine, work of human hands. Yes. Like this is, this is, uh, we're taking creation. Yeah. And how we have cultivated and cared for the garden. And we are taking these gifts. Like there's certain, there's, there's certain parameters for mm-hmm. how to actually make the host. You can't just go down, you know, into the bread aisle at, you know, the supermarket and mm-hmm. pick out like some, you know, Sara Lee and throw it up on the altar. It doesn't work. There's there's a preparation way to it. So uh, that even kind of gets into it. Okay. So yeah, going forward, just considered how the perfecter wants to perfect you. Yep. That's kind of the prayer. Like, all right, Lord, I would desire perfection. You're the perfecter. How might you want to perfect me? Mm-hmm. Right? Okay, great. So that's in the offertory piece. Yep. Next Second listen. one is listen. Listen, that's when we stop talking. But in this case, with the melancholic... It's not necessarily stop talking because they're not an extroverted personality. They are introverted. So in this case, stop ruminating. Stop thinking about it because prayer is not the same thing as thinking. Yes. All right. Thinking alone. Like we can meditate on these things. Mm -hmm. All right. But just letting our imaginations run wild or letting our thinking kind of just run where it will, uh, especially when it starts to go to these places of darkness and despair and catastrophizing Mm -hmm. this is not prayer and we can sit down as melancholics Mm. and we can be in front of the blessed sacrament or we can be at mass and all of the things are running through our head 
it's not prayer. It's not prayer. Like that is that is our mind actually those are distractions that are coming to our mind. And so that custody of the mind is such an important virtue for the melancholic because Because you guys are smart. It's a really a it's a really wild and strong horse. Our our minds, perhaps more so than any other temperaments, are really super strong in the rumination train, right? So there's a lot of momentum that can be built up there, which means you really gotta break that mare, tame that horse so that it can be routed towards things and, and be strong leads to strong meditation, which leads to strong contemplation. All right. Yeah. Um, so so this is a problem because you're in hopes of praying, you're ruminating. And so you're kind of taking your own counsel yeah. over the Lord. Mm-hmm. Um but so often like just to be intentional about the ruminations and be like, am I ruminating or am I actually praying here? Mm -hmm. And I think that's like actually a helpful application. I know I'm jumping ahead, but when you are ruminating with yourself, you are not in relationship with the Lord. So you're not listening. Yeah. So anxiety is going to show up. Shame is going to show up. Yep. Um, Yeah. Those are the indicators. Disappointment is going to show up. Uh, Fear is going to show up Mm -hmm. like these. All these emotions are emotions that actually cause us to hide rather than move towards a relationship. Right. It's Mm -hmm. it's so that's that's something, again, it's a barrier to the actual relationship, which is the basis of sound discernment. Yeah. Uh, You're not listening. God. You're not even taking good counsel. You're taking your own counsel. Uh, You're not in relationship at that point. Okay. Some Some, mindsets. Some of the mindsets. uh, I have to figure this out. Mm. Sounds pretty. Right. Um, And. The clarity does not come from us. Doesn't mean don't engage your 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 reason. your reason and your intellect, right? There's some things that we can know based on our finite reason capacities, but there does come a point where the vision God wants to give to you is beyond mm. our ability for our cognitive faculties to grasp. Okay, this is even this is the the spiritual life. This is the dark night of the soul, where the Lord is inviting us into places where we. It's, it's, it's literally a dark path that he's inviting us down because it's beyond our ability, our human faculties to embrace, right? But this is where, Lord, I must decrease, you must increase is, is part of the prayer that's going on here. Yeah, I mean, I think meditation is like... Sure. It's like an, um, an anti-something. Antidote, right? Anti- no. An- sure. I said, it, I said it wrong. No, you said it right. Antidote, not anecdote. Okay, it's an antidote. We get those confused sometimes. Meditation is an antidote, like Catholic meditation is an antidote to this this rumination, this worry. Yes, this intense, mo- and so it comes by making acts of the will. Yeah. When this sh- shows up, okay. So it's just like we've our ruminations are like exercising our brains to think certain things. Yeah. All right. Now, when they're thinking things that are of God. This is a virtuous application. The way that we come to think and ruminate on things that are, are of God is by making, <coughs> excuse me, acts of the will. Mm-hmm. I had a little peanut in my throat here. Acts of the will that, uh, ult- oh, thank you very much. Mm-hmm. That direct your focus at God. Exactly. Yeah. Right? And so it's just like my mind is, I have my mind. My mind is not something that has me. I'm in charge of my thoughts. Mm. Right? I always like to think of, of Dr. Octopus, right? That has the four, uh, like, evil arms that are attached to him and, like, it's the end of the movie in Spider-Man 2 and he's just like, no, listen to me, listen to me. It's like these acts of the will where it's like, I'm not going to com- continue submitting yeah. to these evil ruminations and evil thoughts. I'm going to use my will to exercise what I know to be right and they're going to obey me and eventually, yeah, that's what happens in the movie. It's kind of cool. All right. So I I can't, av- I, I can't avoid failure. Yeah. Like- I think that's a thought. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, totally. <laughs> um, sure, if you just want to live in the cave for the rest of your life. Yeah, if you want to not do anything. But also other people might look at that as failure too. So uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know it literally if that's is failure. Failure is defined <laughs> as like the omission of the things needed to accomplish yeah. a goal, something like that. Okay, so the omission, not acting, not doing anything, you're failing at that point. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then finally, I can find the perfect way. Yeah. Mm, sounds pretty it's so even comforting it's like ah oh, yeah i can find it i can find the perfect way and it's like just remember who is the way you're you're going the wrong way when you're thinking that i sought this for a long time you guys with with like providing for my family really orchestrating this perfect way 
And Metanoia Catholic has been an experience of seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, mm-hmm. and all of these things will be added to you. Like that is, your heavenly father knows that you need them. It's, it's amazing. It's so fun. It's so liberating to just seek first the kingdom of God and then just sit in the provision that he provides. And folks, it's enough. It is enough. Yeah, what was like an example of this, Matt, from your life? Uh, well, when I resigned from my, my job and, and we went full time. Yeah. Went full time, it's like full time as entrepreneurs. It was right at the height of COVID. And I remember this, this is where I was trying to avoid uh, find this perfect way of, of oh, resigning my job. So you weren't really? trying to avoid finding the perfect way. You were trying to find the perfect way. No, I, I was trying. This is an example of me trying to find the perfect way. Got it. Right. Uh, and so I, when I was having a tough, such a tough time with it, maybe you've heard this story before. I've used it a couple of times in the podcast. But when I, I'd been at this job for six, six years, my boss was amazing. I loved him. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was so afraid of disappointing him and hurting him and, um, and at the same time, we had just an unbelievable success, success, excuse me, with one of our launches and it had really, the, the Lord was, it was all the conditions were right for us to just move forward and step out as entrepreneurs full time. Mm-hmm. And, um, it was on Good Friday and, uh, when I went into his office, but it pro- and resigned, but prior to that, I was looking for a way to do it where I could control his emotions to fit this image of perfection, my mm. perfect way of resigning. Mm. And Aaron, you said to me, it was like, hey, why don't you just give this permission to be uncomfortable? Mm-hmm. And there was such peace that came along with that because I was no longer focused on like, how was I going to control his Yourself. emotions, which I couldn't yeah. do. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was also like, hey, just allow this to be a little bit uncomfortable mm. and allow this to... N- Allow yourself to not have this perfect image in mind and go forward. Allow it to be a little bit obscure, a little bit dark, the path in front of you, mm-hmm. and step out in faith. And that the, the way that he responded was, was actually so far away from where I, like my catastrophes. It wasn't even like, it wasn't even like my best case scenario, it was my better case scenario, mm-hmm. you know? And so the Lord was just so gracious. And again, it was just a confirmation that this was the right thing to be doing at this point. Um, and so that was a learning. That was a mm. lesson learned for me. Yeah. Where this, okay, I, I don't want to, uh, I'm afraid of listening because I'm afraid, I want to have this, I'm afraid that the Lord might invite me down this path that mm. I don't really have control over, I can't fully see, and that's scary to me. So, so it's really like the ruminating is to avoid pain. Yeah. That, I mean, that's like you're trying to like conceptualize all the different ways mm-hmm. that you're going to avoid pain. And the the interesting thing Invo- is... Avoid self-imposed pain that you can avoid. Y- well, the interesting thing is, is you are creating the pain yes. ahead of time because you're going down all these like imaginative rabbit holes yes. and yeah. you're ruminating. And in that case, it's like just reality was so much better. And the Lord just like was like, hey, I want you to receive this gift yeah. of reality. And it was a gift. Yeah. So and it was a gift. So I, I mean I think I think the desire to use your God given reason is is a beautiful desire. Yeah. But I think you also consider how um trying to figure it out how how you're actually creating more pain, mm-hmm. the thing that you're trying to avoid <laughs> by trying to figure it out yeah. ahead of time. Yes, yes. And so like uh you're when you're you're ruminating to avoid that pain, consider how your ruminations may actually be causing that unnecessary pain. Is yeah. another way of looking at right. it. Right. I mean, and for for the melancholic that tends to be that high intellect, high logical thinking, I think we can just kind of just all right. Am I causing this pain myself? Am I like what's the emotion that I'm feeling right now? Am I causing this emotion with my ruminations? Yes, I am. Okay. I'm actually living in my worst nightmare and I'm creating it and I don't have to. <laughs> so yeah. that can be the pain necessary even to motivate you to get out of those continued ruminations. I think also another application just from that story is like, like allow it to be uncomfortable for a second. Yeah. You know, because that's the whole reason why you're trying to avoid all of it. That's mm-hmm. the whole reason why you're ruminating is like, it's going to be uncomfortable. Well, first of all, we don't know that for a fact. You yeah. do not know if it's going to be uncomfortable or not, but if you were to allow it to be, you might find that you're spending a whole lot of time living in 
some fantasy world that is never going to happen. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right. Next step. Act. Act. This is taking massive action here. So um, the Melancock is slow to act because of pretty much everything that we've already discussed, but also because they want that certainty before mm-hmm. acting. Yes. There's that. And the certainty is similar to the last one that we just talked about where it's like that certainty is is there to avoid possible pain up front. Yeah. Like you, you don't want to waste time. You don't want to pick the wrong thing. Yep. Uh, you don't want to make the wrong decision. So mm-hmm. it's like avoiding these. And, and even all of those things like I'm a, there's a, in, so, in a lot of cases, there's not even like a right or wrong decision. There's just a decision. Mm-hmm. I mean, what we're talking about choosing between two goods which is what is the foundation of discernment, right? If you're choosing between good and evil, you have your decision made. Don't choose the evil, choose the good. But it's when it's between two goods, that's where it's just like, okay, the relationship with the Lord is what's going to guide us this way. Yeah. I mean, and that's another reason why this is a problem is that mm-hmm. it, it like disrupts the relationship with the Lord. I have coached so many Catholics, so many Catholics, so many melancholic Catholics um, on, I don't know what the right way is is Mm -hmm. and this is becoming very clear to me actually as we are recording this podcast and it's like all right first of all you do it's it's the one who said i am the way Mm -hmm. he wasn't like i am a way or maybe sometimes he's like i am the way so like first of all stop lying to yourself you do know the way okay but it's moving from a place of action which ruminating is a cognitive action right it, it, you and know so it feels like there's a lot of action yes. taking place yeah sometimes. it's moving from that to relationship okay. so it's moving into a communion versus oh i'm gonna be over here figuring out the right way it's no this is he is inviting you into that relationship. And he's I like, see. let me show you. Okay, so it's rather than the mindset of, I want to know the way, it's I want to be in relationship with yes. the Yes. Okay. Yeah, I want to be so close to the way that I never want to ask this question again. Yeah, I want the way to literally be living in me. Yeah. Like, <laughs> and, and, I am... And I'm, I in, in, in and him. And I in him and him in me. Yeah. I, 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 John 17, I always yeah. think of I am the walrus. I am me and you is me. Uh, Anyways, okay. That's my brain. Um, An an example with this was actually I went through recently was um, launching this compass course. Okay, so we have this course that there's a pilot of it going on. We're going to have a lot more of these going on. I really see this being as something that is going to be a a great gift to to the church. All right. Uh, Collaborating with people like Rick Newton over at the Newton Institute and Pat Molyneux. Uh, over at Human Formation Coalition. He's been a great advisor in this. And in, even Josh Miller over at Franciscan University, he wrote... Uh, the M Code. The M Code. He's one of the founders of, of We've the had uh, Motivation Code. We had him on the podcast. So he's kind of leaning into it. The Lord is just, is just bringing all this great counsel uh, into, into this. Uh, but nonetheless, um, I had a lot of trepidation just mm-hmm. launching the course. And f- for me, I, I think... Uh, I always know your melancholics coming up to the front when you're not taking action. And I'm always like, what's yeah. going on here? Okay. It's anyway. Like, well, th- it, there was a lot of, for me, it was a lot of identity that mm. was wrapped up in this because it was, uh, I, I love so much helping other people discover and live their unique calling. I love that being, I, it's so much that I, I can't not do it. It's, mm-hmm. and so this program is literally me doing that like the program is designed to do that and so there's this fear that if it doesn't work then who am i like i've 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 lost myself and so Mm. there's a little bit of me still wrapping up my identity and mission versus relationship that's there but that's what was being exposed like the mission if if we if we think it's mission identity relationship we get it backwards it's relationship identity and mission that's Mm. again one of the foundational things that we've been talking about in this podcast so it, discernment being a relationship so um and like the certainty that i was that i was lacking was i want this to be s- my purpose i wanted certainty mm-hmm. that this was my purpose and i feared launching this course and discovering evidence to the contrary because that would just be devastating to yeah. me um going through the course itself actually started to, to help me realize that like no 
there's a story, there's a trajectory of the story of my life. Mm -hmm. And this is actually, this would make sense for this to be on the trajectory. So it, and and also I like, I gave myself permission for this to not reveal the fullness of who I am, Mm. but to just, to maybe even explore a little bit more. I just, it, it, I, I made it a little bit smaller. Mm -hmm. I kind of started just not this, this might reveal a little bit more, but it's not going to be a course ever that reveals the fullness of who you are. God is going to do that. Okay. I'm recognizing that there's a little obscurity. I'm going to walk by faith. I don't know where this is going to go. I can tell you right now, the Lord is blessing it. Like we're a couple of weeks into it. I'm loving it. Um, there's still some imperfections that I'm finding in myself showing mm-hmm. up in it. That's okay. All right. That's part of the process. Yeah. Um, but like it's, we're, we're taking some action and there's still a little bit of fear that's there, but it's not like an overpowering fear. There's certainly uncertainty that's there, but I find the Lord is still showing up mm. and I'm finding myself inclined to cling to him more in the midst of this. And that is what is truly bearing the fruit in my own life. Well, it's, I mean, it's that whole imagery of like clinging to the way, like, yeah. you know, like actually being like, oh, you're the way. So I have to be in relationship with oh, and, you. And that was it. It was kind of like stepping back and being like, oh, I don't have to be the guru. I don't have to be the guy with all the answers. Yay. I just have to be pressure a facilitator off. and show up as, as myself, knowing that is going to be insufficient for what these men need on this mm-hmm. journey. And Christ fills in the rest. Amen. Feel good. Like that was that was so much better. So, uh, yeah. So the application here, okay, would be like to look at certainty, this desire for certainty, this desire to know the way, as a good thing. Yeah, because it's actually an invitation to come into relationship with the way, mm-hmm. with with the one who is not a liar, who called himself the way. Yeah. Right. And so it's just where we're going to for it once again. I mean, if you're not picking up on this pattern, pick it up, pick up on it now because we're being very intentional and saying like, you are not the source of that perfection. You are not the source of that certainty. You are not the source of figuring out that way. Yeah. Nor are other people. Yes. That was, and that was kind of a, a, just a a problem I was identifying Mm -hmm. in myself. Like I was, I was afraid that, someone was going to come out and like one of my participants was like, this thing sucks. Like this is bad. (laughs) And so now it was like, okay, I need to control their perception of the, of the course. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, there was a lot of just, I need to control them in order to, because that's how the Lord is going to speak to me. It's just like, okay, the Lord can speak through constructive feedback and not very well though. I mean, it, no, no. Oh, it, he can speak, like, he can speak constru- through constructive well, oh, feedback. Oh, sorry. I'm but saying like, that when you're per- is, trying to control everybody. Again, yeah, yeah, when it's, when it's, when it, again, it was me letting go of the Lord, taking my focus off the Lord in that relationship and, and focusing on other people. Like mm-hmm. the outcome is it actually leads to a sucky course because yeah. it's no longer me being led by the Lord. It's me being led by myself and my own desires, like mm-hmm. misguided desires to be seen well by other people and that's how i'm defining success so like again imperfections sort of bubble up to the surface as we walk by faith here folks yeah and that's not to be afraid of it's like okay it's here let's deal with this lord i give it to you i mean i'm going to present to you guys a thought this would work for me as a as a sanguine phlegmatic so i don't know if it would work for you but i'm going to present it cool what if you saw something like certainty is none of my business (laughs) I, I think it's good. I, like, How does that land? Well, I like even building, for, for me, I like building an association of certainty being actually like contrary to relationship with God. Like me seeking certainty is something that actually is not mine to seek. It's but actually a certainty barrier. Certainty is none of my business. It's, it's, I yeah. think that's, and, and that's part of it. I think, yeah. So that's, that's a way, but like, I, I just like even saying, you know, it's just a, it's a fruitless thing to seek certainty on this side of heaven, right? Mm. So that is that is for the people that have gone through their purgation and have been purified and actually have the the, yeah. the capacity to receive the beatific vision, right? They can they can have the certainty at that point on this side of heaven. It's not going to be me. So yeah. awesome. I'm going to walk by faith. All right. Finally, examine. Examine. Examine is when we reflect and examine the fruits of this. So it's kind of cool because 
you were kind of examining it ahead of time, mm -hmm. like the fruits of this course. Yes. Interesting. You were like, kind of like, okay, so if I showed up this particular way, trying to control everybody's emotions, like that's going to suck. It's not going to be a cool course. Yeah. Like it's, nobody's going to get as much out of it. Yeah. It's very self-serving. Right. But yes. what, what do you, what would you say is a defect for the melancholic specifically in the examine process? Well, I, I think when, when we're talking about examination, we're, looking back and we're reflecting on the fruits of, of our actions. Mm -hmm. I think as melancholics, we can, we can not give equal airtime ah. to the good and the bad. So I think there's a tendency to just get hi yeah, hyper focus on all the areas that we failed and everything that went wrong mm -hmm. and all the things that sucked and, and all the ways, that, it, all the ways that it was imperfect, all the ways it did not meet it, meet your expectations. Yeah. All the ways it disappointed yeah. you. Right. And so it's not saying, don't look at those things. It's saying, look at all the evidence, right? It's all of it's it. it's like a, it's an abuse of your of your mind and your memory to only look at part of the data, right? Because it's actually actually going to bring you to a deeper understanding. Like yeah. a good scientist is going to look without any sort of bias towards all of the data. And once again, just know to just to have some self compassion here. Know that you're probably looking to all the negative side of it. Out of self protection, out of out of to say like I'm just not going to do that again, right? Yes. Like so, there's there. It's to avoid that pain. It's mm -hmm. to like go to that place, which I think is so so much at the core of all of this. It's mm -hmm. like I'm going to avoid pain by looking at all the negative things. <laughs> it's just so contrary then to I'll what actually how, yeah that what actually happens like to the actual the fruit of yes. it right it literally causes the pain right if i look at all of these negative things i will avoid future pain and it's like but you're creating it right now by not giving equal airtime to the things that you actually did yeah and the things that the fruits, the good fruits that yeah. came from it. Yeah. So some of those mindsets that show up are like, ah, see, I knew it wouldn't work. I told you yep. so. I'm like, sure, there were some good things, but, mm -hmm. um, and, and like, it didn't meet my expectations. It wasn't perfect. And I, 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 get, I, I love what you said, Aaron. I think we think that that is going to be something that's helpful and help us, helpful by helping us to avoid pain in the future. But it actually causes a whole lot of pain right now, and it does not create hope. Yeah. Right? Real change doesn't happen from sitting in disappointment. Disappointment is healthy to the extent that it helps you arrive at reality of, I had an expectation. Yeah. And where I really arrived was something below that or that didn't meet it. All mm -hmm. right? So it reveals the gap. But that's all disappointment does. Disappointment doesn't actually... It's not an emotion that inclines you to close the gap. Hope inclines you to close the gap. Mm. And so Boom. in the examination, we want to ultimately leave with a resolution that is hopeful, mm -hmm. right? And St. Ignatius talks about this. Like, we want to have a good resolution at the end of it. And that's going to be not just beat ourselves up and think that that's going to somehow get us moving, right? We want to get hope. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right. Yeah. Yeah. So like the application here is, well, obviously like, Give some, um, affirm the good that you're seeking. And the good that you're seeking is probably growth, like intentional mm -hmm. growth. But just know that when you are hyper-focused on the negative or there's an imbalance, like Matt was saying, give it equal airtime. Give the good things equal airtime too. Because right now it might be 95% here are all the crazy, awful, terrible things that happened. And then 5%, just kind of even that out a little bit. Yeah. And what you can do by doing that is just, okay, what else happened? What was good that happened? What worked, right? Yes. That's yes. why we ask it in that order. What worked? What didn't work? What would you do differently? Mm -hmm. First of all, it takes all the drama out of it. No drama allowed. It's very like kind of um, like scientific in that it's just like empirically you're you're looking and you're you're trying to find evidence. You're like, what worked? What didn't work? And what would what would you? do differently i love you've always said this you're like let's try this as an experiment let's try this as a beta it gives you permission to not let it yes. be perfect and let and allow yourself to be in that learning mode that continual learning mode and yeah. so i i love looking at the examine portion is like what have we learned yes there's oh and there's always learning that can come through it and yeah and it's it's like what what worked what worked well? What do we learn that worked well that we can continue learning? Yeah. I remember back when 
when I was, we had virtual Catholic conference and we'd send out feedback forms to, you know, hundreds of participants and we get the feedback and I would just kind of be looking at all these things and the vast majority of people are like, so grateful. This is great. Like then keep doing this. And, and then, but I would get hyper focused <laughs> on the few people that were just like, well, I really would have liked if this button was over here or I had really tough, <laughs> difficult time navigating this stuff over here. And, and it's just like I would just hyper focus and I want to solve that problem. And that's kind of even part of my design is like that restorative wanting to look, enjoying solving problems. So like there's even a delight in finding a problem, right? So I think there's melancholics can identify that as well. But it, it wasn't really, it wasn't giving equal airtime. And, and also, like I, I even had a mindset behind the affirmations, like the positive feedback. I was like, well, this just isn't, it's nice, but it's not helpful. And so I would, I was dismissive of that, uh, of even the good thing. And again, it's just, it's not, but ultimately I would just be exhausted. I'd be exhausted, uh, by, by these feedback. And sometimes yeah. I would like, wouldn't even really read them. <laughs> like just because I was afraid of feeling that exhaustion because I knew where my hyper focus was going to go. Yeah. But it's yeah. just not, it's not a good examination that what I'm doing. I think a yeah. good, a good examine, like even like just based off of that example that you just gave a good journal prompt is like, how do I think I will feel if I, if I look at all of the negative things? What do you mean? Tell me more. Like, how do I think this is helpful? Okay. Like, like why do I really, think this is helpful? Right. Like, yeah. thank you. Why do I think this is helpful? Like, but what do I think I'm actually going to feel after looking at all this stuff? Yeah. And, and then focusing on it, on all the negative things. Like, I think you're going to find the solution that's going to allow you to perfect the model so that you can avoid <laughs> the pain in the future. Forever and always. You will be a perfect human person well, and you will make that. You will create that in yes. yourself. So there's, Just kidding. And I want to affirm, again, the desire to want to continue to improve. That's a good thing. But the desire to eradicate, eradicate pain or eradicate any potential failure or to achieve certainty is going to lead to more pain. Mm-hmm. And it's going to lead to failure and it's going to lead to greater uncertainty because you're not growing in faith. You're going to be, you're going to be stuck where you are at that point. Yeah. Cool. So that's the melancholics, how the melancholics could improve a little bit mm-hmm. in their discernment steps. So we went through um, the way that the melancholic offers, right? Those defects also the same way. Listen. Uh, and then finally the act and examination here. So. Hope this has been helpful for you. Next week, we've got the uh, phlegmatic. We're going to focus on, last but not least, our lovely phlegmatics, right? And how they can discern well. Because this is all being couched within our leadership podcast on how the leader receives that vision. Remember, the leader always goes first. And what do they go first doing? They go first receiving and submitting to the vision from God. That's what a good Catholic leader is going to do. Yeah. And so how you go about doing that is going to be through this process of discernment. Yes. All right. So stay tuned. All right. See you guys later. Hey, thanks for sticking with us in the Catholic Coaching Podcast. If you like what you heard, please like and subscribe and we'll see you again.